Hello, everyone. Very excited to be here. My name is Daniel. I am a co-founder at CTO at Cradle, a company at the intersection of biology and machine learning. We are a relatively young company, founded about two and a half years ago, roughly 40 people across two offices in Zurich and in Amsterdam. And the topic that I'm going to discuss today is proteins. Now, I know it's nearly lunchtime, and maybe many of you are thinking of that healthy, nutritious, protein-rich food that you're going to have. But I'm afraid today's talk is going to be about proteins as the small building blocks of life. Let's take a few examples of proteins just to set the stage. This is an antibody. They are, occur naturally in our bloodstream, but crucially, they can also be engineered to neutralize pathogens or to attach to specific types of cancers. This one here, if my button works, is a T7 RNA polymerase. As its name suggests, this uh, protein catalyzes the formation of RNA based on a DNA strand. It can be used, for example, in the production of mRNA vaccines, which are all familiar with after the COVID pandemic. And lastly, the last example is a pet haze. Can you guess, based on its name, what this protein does? There's no type on the slide. It, yes? <laughs> Absolutely. It degrades plastics. It's a protein that is able to decompose uh, polyethylene interaphthalate into its monomers. And it is a potential solution to humanity's plastic problem. So we've seen three examples so far, but depending on how you count, there are maybe <clears throat> 250 million proteins out there. I said, depending on how you count, biologists out there might disagree. Um, and their applications are really wide, starting with the food industry, maybe with petrochemicals, pharma, materials, recycling, fuels, you name it. According to a 2020 study by McKinsey, roughly 60% of our global economic input. Can I go back? Oh, a, slide, a slide was clip, skipped. Oh well, I'm going to um, speak on this slide. So there was a slide saying that 60% of our global economic input could in theory be produced with biological processes, that is with proteins that are custom designed. The problem is that many of these proteins, the way they occur in nature, are not really practically usable. Take the example of pates. Yes, it can degrade PET, but to the best of my knowledge, I haven't seen a single lab or company that was able to degrade a single plastic bottle. And that's because the protein is just too slow and too unstable to be practically usable. So in order for us to be able to produce 60% of our global economic input with biological processes, we need to make these proteins better. We need leaps in the science of protein engineering. Protein engineering is the science of uh, making edits to a protein such that we enhance several of its properties. The reason why protein engineering didn't have a very large impact so far, it did have an impact, but not a, a huge impact that it could potentially have, is that engineering proteins is truly, really, really hard. It is error prone, it is expensive and it is very slow. If protein engineering would have a mascot, it would be this golden drunker turtle crawling across the field. And yes, that is the bottle of Smirnoff on the slide, in case you're squinting. Why is it error prone? Well, there's twofold. First of all, when we design a protein, typically, you know, we do random mutagenesis, we make some random mutations, and then uh, test them in the lab, or we use some physics-based tools where uh, we are trying to guess what mutations would be beneficial. The problem is that in over 99% of the cases, these guesses are wrong. It's also error prone because measuring what a protein does is really hard. Imagine the pates, pates. How do you measure how effective it is? You have to actually measure the rate of a chemical reaction, and this is no small feat. It has an error in itself, and that error confuses models that are trained on this data. Why it's expensive? I guess this is very simple. Um, every single data point, every single protein that we measure can cost anywhere between ten dollars to $10,000 if you go to x-ray crystallography. 
that's a lot of money for every single data point. And in order to measure proteins, there's no such like, here's a lab that can measure any protein for any property. For every single protein and property pair, we need to set up a so-called assay. Setting up an assay with really good biologists can take three to six months on average. Once the assay is set up, again, depending on the throughput, but in general, we can assay, we can measure 96 proteins at the same time. Measuring these 96 takes, on average, three months. That is a lot of time. Many of the clients that work with us come to us with projects that have been going on for over two years. That is a very, very long time. So, okay, I guess you're all uh, wondering, uh, well, if protein engineering is so darn hard, why am I standing here talking about it? Um, is there a better approach? And this is what I'm going to talk about, a better approach for engineering proteins. First, just to make sure we're on the same page, let's clarify our objective. The objective is, given a protein that sort of works, to optimize it such that it works to the level where we want it to be. We go back again to uh, one of the proteins I presented. I believe that's an antibody. Um, <clears throat> we saw the 3D structure of this protein. But as you, I'm sure, remember from high school biology, there is another way of representing a protein. Right? It's a polypeptide. It's a string of amino acids. There are only 20 amino acids total. Each of them is represented with a letter of the English alphabet. Now, let's make a mental exercise and think about that text there on your right as some secret message in a language we don't know. We know that computers are really good at deciphering messages in languages they don't know. Let's call this language language of nature. Let's call it proteinish. We have been really good at creating models that take swath of, of text, let's say in English, and are able to produce coherent text. One of them is famously ChatGPT. Here, it helpfully informs me that, yes, this conference is actually worth attending. So what it means is that ChatGPT understood the question and was able to produce an answer that made sense, and in this case, hopefully, was also correct. Let's take a very, very quick look of ChatGPT 101. How are models such as ChatGPT trained? It's actually really simple. I know machine learning people tend to make it sound like there's an art, there's a dark thing of to what they do. Really have to be really, really smart. The ideas behind machine learning are really very simple. What we do here is we show the model, machine learning model, large corpora of text. And when I say large, I mean really large, like entire Wikipedia or more. So we show them sentence by sentence, and then we hide a few words. And that's the model to guess the word that was hidden. At the beginning, the model is a pretty bad job at guessing, because it's just random. But as more data is shown, and as it is rewarded for good guesses and penalized for bad guesses, it's trying to figure out, it manages to figure out, what is the best match in that context. Here, how are you doing today? The model has figured out that you is the most natural word to come there, because the most frequent. But how are they doing today? How are the kids doing today? Are also valid approaches. But they have a lower likelihood, because they occur less frequently. And now here comes the truly amazing fact. We can steal this idea shamelessly from language models and apply it to protein engineering. Well, instead of sentences, we have a protein. Instead of words, we have amino acids. In this example, that's the beginning of an antibody. If I remember correctly, uh, we are hiding the valine and ask the model, the V is a valine, and ask the model to guess what would be a good fit there. And the model has learned after training that, yes, indeed, valine is the most likely amino acid, but serine or alanine, the S and the A, are also likely substitutes. So maybe the more skeptical in the audience are right now thinking, OK, so we have a model that is able to substitute amino acids. So what? What's the big deal? Because what we want to do is we want a model that creates better Proteins, right? Not the model is substituting amino acids with others that sort of work. So again, as good scientists do, we steal another idea from language modeling. ChatGPT is able, for example, to take a text and alter it slightly that it sounds differently. Here, I inputted the text, the kid kicked the red ball, and I didn't actually write through ChatGPT, I just changed it myself to something I thought was funny, but looking at the audience, it wasn't that funny. Um, <clears throat> and we made this text sound more academic. Uh, the same idea we can, we can apply to protein engineering. Here, 
we take a protein and ask the model to increase its thermal stability or its activity. Anybody notice the type on the slide? Paying attention? Yeah? It's thermal stability, not activity. So fine. We have, how do we train these models? So far, we have a model that has seen hundreds of millions of proteins and is able to produce reasonable changes to it. We now start showing the models data from the lab. That is, we show variants of a protein. Some of them are more stable, some of them are less stable. Some of them are more active, some of them are less active. And remember, this is the model that speaks proteinish fluently, better than I speak English. And then, after, can you guess how many samples? Remember, this is a model that has learned with hundreds of millions of proteins. How many samples does the model need in order to actually be able to distinguish proteins that are more stable from proteins that are less stable? Anybody a wild guess? Don't be shy. How many? Three. OK, anybody more? Ah. No, you knew it. It's exactly right. It's, it's, she said 100. It's actually 96, because you know, biologists like in 96 world plates. Uh, but yeah, uh, wow, I'm, I'm impressed. Are you working in ML with biology? No? OK. <laughs> yes, indeed. So after only 96 samples, uh, these models are able to distinguish between proteins that have an improved property and proteins that don't have that improved property. Even more important, these models are able to optimize multiple properties at the same time. For us statisticians, it's just a function with one variable versus a function with three or four variables. Same thing, you just optimize it. No difference. You do a gradient descent. For example, why is this important? Uh, let's take antibodies again. Well, we do want antibodies to bind to the target, right? We do want them to bind to the pathogen they are targeting. But we absolutely do not want that antibody to bind to anything else because that can potentially be lethal. So one is affinity, the other one is specificity, two properties that are also against each other. We want the antibody to be soluble. We want it to spread in the bloodstream. And we want the antibody to be stable. We want it to be part of our bloodstream for a certain time until it reaches its effect. To the best of my knowledge, the only way to optimize multiple properties of a protein at the same time is using this statistical machine learning based approach. OK, so we developed this. We're a young company, right? We developed this about a year ago. We tried it in our own lab. It worked pretty well. So we looked for a client that would be willing to test um, our method. We found a client who has been working on a P450 uh, cytochrome. This is a protein that basically um, makes um, xenobiotics water soluble, maybe in simple terms that sounds too fancy. It's a detox protein. Um, it's used, it has therapeutic um, effects. Um, and they have been optimizing this protein for 11 rounds. That's roughly three years. The problem was that between the 10th and the 11th round, they could not optimize anymore. They reached a ceiling. The protein was exactly as active after the 11th round as it was after the 10th round. So they said, okay, let's try this ML thing, see if it works. And here is uh, a little bit uh, the data that we have. On gray, we have the 11 rounds. I didn't draw the 11th round because it was just a flat line. So we saw the data as the customer has optimized so far, and then the data after the machine learning was optimized. So we reached from an eight, we went from an 8x improvement to a roughly 24x improvement uh, in activity. This is a quick glimpse on how protein engineers would interact with the Cradle software. It's a web-based application. It requires no ML knowledge, of course. All you do is you upload target protein. You say which are the properties you would like to optimize. If you have some data from the lab, great, upload it. The models train themselves, understand the data, and respond with a proposed sequences to be tested in the lab. The results from the lab came back. The models learn even more, because that's the adventure of machine learning, right? The more data you have, the more accurate the models get. And this is the virtuous circle, and hopefully after two, three, four rounds, we achieve the desired target. One thing that I think, maybe two things that are crucial, how amount of time, woo, -hoo, okay. Uh, don't worry, last slide, almost. Um, we are a software company, we do not uh, take any IP, uh, software that is licensed, and we are private by design. That is, all the models and all the data that are trained for a customer are fully destroyed, once the project is closed, and there's no cross-pollination. There's no cradle model that learns from that data. Everything is destroyed afterwards. Although we're a young company, we are lucky and honored to be working with industry leaders, leaders in this domain, uh, whether it's in the pharma industry, the enzyme, or uh, petrochemicals. And here's my prediction. 
if we, and I mean we as humanity, not we at Kratos, manage to decipher the language of proteins, thousands and thousands of companies will emerge that will tackle challenges that are currently unthinkable. They will tackle diseases that currently have no treatment. They will maybe reverse the pollution that we're facing or even reverse climate change. Thank you very much.